kitty. Hello. Hey, everybody. Oh, just a reminder, we're going to be talking about a topic and then we'll take questions after uh, we're done talking. And yeah. I mean, uh, Kelly, because uh, we're talking about ponds today. Oh, I love ponds. Ponds are the best. So first of all, Annette, what a great intro. I know. She's so talented. She's amazing. Yeah, we were back and forth all weekend sending her pictures and stuff and she was like rendering different versions of it God, and she's, so good. she's so good i know so kids i brought a powerpoint visual aids Woo! <laughs> how exciting all right well are you ready to uh to open the powerpoint let's go let's do it boom Okay, uh, let's see. This banner thing might be in the way. We'll see as we go. Yeah. So we're talking about pond plants today, and I love ponds. So I've had my pond since, I think, 2016, maybe 2017. And it's that wooden box that you see there. And there's also a couple of tub ponds on the side of it. But um, it's a lot of fun. And I do it a lot more low tech than I do my aquarium. And I think it's, honestly, I think it's more approachable even than a planted tank. And it's, uh, this is all done on the cheap because this, this was built when I was like a poor adjunct professor. So it's a fun hobby for the summer. So let's talk about pond schedule. So I am in Northern Indiana and I'm zone 6A for gardening. Um, which means I can't really get my pond going probably until I could probably get it going maybe in mid-May, depending on the weather. Usually I do it Memorial Day weekend because Jake and I usually just spend three days doing it together because we have to wash the gravel and get it ready. And that's kind of heavy for me to do by myself. But, you know, it depends where you are in the United States or worldwide, whether you could maybe even start your pond now. Some people can have ponds going year round. If you're in Southern California or you're in South Florida, I mean, you could be ponding as we speak. Mm -hmm. So I'm in nine uh, zone 9B, nine 9A nine or 9B. Um, you could pond right now. How? What are your nights getting down to? Um, sometimes there, it's still, the weather is all over the place. Like it was in the thirties just this yeah. past weekend and it, right now it's 67 <laughs> and it's, you know, it's, it's beautiful right now, but yeah, still um, kind of touch and go. you know, it depends. You can get the plants going at any time if it's not going to freeze. Mm -hmm. Um, I, today is warm, but like we had a low of 18 degrees on Saturday. So I don't even want to stick my hands in my pond, but for you, Steven, you know, the water would probably be pretty warm. You could get your plants going if you felt like it. Um, and then I'm not going to talk much about fish. It, it just depends on what fish you choose when you put them out. I have goldfish. My goldfish live in my pond year round. I use a stock tank heater um, and an air stone. The air stone keeps them ice free until about 20 degrees Fahrenheit. And below that, mm -hmm. I have a stock tank heater that keeps them from freezing over. As long as there is a hole in the ice for gas exchange, the fish are fine. This pond isn't really about fish for me. But you do um, have fish in there, right? You said you have a couple of goldfish. There. I have goldfish in there and I've had them for years. But at a certain point, I can't even see them because they're so covered by plants. So, you know. Are they alive? <laughs> yeah, they are, and they get bigger. They they've gotten bigger over the years, so they're. And you, so you keep them in there year round, then. Um, I do. I do keep them in there year round, and once in a while, I do lose a fish. But I've had them spawn too, so I've had baby fish grow up. So, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's go to the next slide. See, that's my job today. I'm clicking slides. That's right. Um, oh, I wanted to ask before we go to the next slide. Do you, you know the approximate gallonage of this? Yeah. Uh, so um, we'll talk about how this pond is constructed. But total, I think that that pond 
is about 350 gallons and it's a small little pond so i mean it's still that's pretty good water volume yeah i mean i have about 10 10 12 goldfish in there that have gotten calm big so i started with 20 feeder goldfish and you know so they live a good life and there's uh, the blind fish keeper brandon says uh, i feel for all you people up uh north of central florida who have to wait for your oh. pond mine run all year long you know what just shut your face brandon i'm cold and i'm tired of it i want my pond <laughs> so bad but i have to wait till may because it's we we can still have some very nasty cold snaps i mean it was four degrees wind chill on saturday Oof. so uh, brooklyn said it was 28 here uh she lives about 10 miles from me it was 28 degrees saturday night that's but pretty cold for you guys that's it, it is time. yeah yeah um you know and my pond i keep it going through i, I mean i think i took mine down right before halloween because we didn't have a frost until then. Um, and the, the plants were still going, but if it's going to frost, like the plants, most of them die back. And there's you know, nothing you could do to like protect, like if you're going to have a deep freeze, but it was only going to be about a 12 hour ordeal. Um, you could, you could cover them. But like, for me, like once October's there, like, yeah. you know, winter's coming. So you could cover them. But it's kind of hard to cover a wet pond, so. Oh, my God. Happy birthday, Eric. Happy birthday, Eric. Yay. <coughs> Eric, you should get a pond for your birthday. I want that for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I have a book to recommend you. This book is really awesome. It's the pond, Tub Pond Handbook. It's by Ted Coletti. It's great for these little small ponds, and they're very cheap. They're very approachable. Um, this book is not expensive. You can find it on Amazon. Just search for Ted Coletti and Pond. Make sure you get the third edition because it's updated. It's like a $20 book. Um, and it's so good. And it also talks about like uh, breeding fish outdoors. So it's really wit it's really written with aquarium keepers in mind. So um, I just think anyone who wants to get a pond should get this book. Yeah, I might have to actually buy and read a book. It's got tons of pictures. Awesome pictures. Ooh, I like pictures. Those are really great. I can't say enough good things about this book. So. Is it a pop-up book? Oh, wouldn't that be great? Yeah. Maybe for the fourth edition, he <laughs> should do that. All right. Uh, next slide. Next slide. All right. So this is my pond. So the person in the picture is my pond friend, Michael, and he built this pond for me. Um, because I, I do not have DIY skills. I do not, I do not do construction. So he built it and it is just a wooden box and it's lined in, um, pond fabric. So pond liner, <coughs> and then it has a wooden box on top with a spillway with the slab for a waterfall. And there's a pond in the bottom of, or, I mean, there's a pump in the bottom of the pond that brings water up to the the filter box and lets it spill over and so all of the filtration in this pond is just biological in this bog box so i don't use any like expensive filters that box is filled with cheap pea gravel so this is so different than i do my aquariums indoors um but that bog um you can fill it with live plants and they do all the water filtering for you. I never get any algae in any of my ponds. And part of that is because all of the surface of the water is covered, but also because the water is very clean. I mean, this is a very healthy pond. Um, and I also don't overstock my pond. I have just a few goldfish in it. You can do a koi pond, but you can't grow plants like this. Koi munch plants um so that person in that picture michael he has a koi pond and we helped him expand his koi pond this summer and he can't grow water lilies at all or lotuses because those assholes just <laughs> chomp down his food so you kind of just you know life is about trade-offs and for me this is kind of 
more about the plants than the fish. Um, if you have a really big pond, I think that maybe your koi will leave it, your plants alone, but not with these smaller ponds. So I don't know a whole lot about goldfish, but I thought that they were kind of plant munchers as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, they'll munch duckweed, which is pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, but they don't really munch big floating plants and they don't munch stuff that grows above the ground. But koi, they're so big and you know, like they're big bulldozers. They will, they'll just munch down a whole water lily. But goldfish <laughs> really aren't a problem. I mean, other to, I guess if I had this to do all over again, if I didn't have my goldfish, I'd probably do rice fish. I think that would be really pretty. But I didn't know about rice fish when I started this. I mean, they're kind of newer to the hobby and, you know, I, I didn't know about them. So. Yeah, I don't know much about them either, other than like they seem to be a, a decent breeding project. Uh, yeah, for and they can take cooler temperatures like goldfish. Mm -hmm. So they're a good choice. But next slide. So the first nice. three or four years I did my pond, it was in full shade. So there's um, that's a magnolia tree that's by it. And this is about the best my pond could ever do. And it's, it's nice, but, you know, um, those, there are canna lilies growing in there and they never bloomed. They're, yeah, this thing right here? or yeah, the... yeah, those are elephant ears growing in the box. And that's a canna lily is the reddish plant. Okay. The front. Um, and they never, they never bloomed. I mean, the foliage is pretty. Um, water hyacinth will never bloom. It's just not enough sun. But it's it's not bad. It looks pretty, and I, I mean, I really enjoyed it. So, but well, then a tree came down because it, there was a storm. So, oh, I know. And well, see, because if I do a pond, this is basically what the best I'm going to do is what you're seeing right here with the tree. Because I got trees all yeah, around. I do have, and we're coming up to that toward the end. I do have some shade plants. To recommend to you that i think look pretty good um and also the plants that are here these are plants he gave me for free i was super broke when i put this pond in like i couldn't blow a lot of money on this pond so and i'm not saying anyone ever has to blow a lot of money on a pond it's something you can do pretty inexpensively but these were free plants and you know Free is good when you're when you don't have a lot of money. So, you were still in uh, grad school. No, I was a I was an adjunct professor. Oh, okay. Well, still in academia, so God, cool. I was, yeah. I mean, I know that there's a reason I do what I do. Mm -hmm. A lot more money than academia. Yeah. So, anyways, next slide. Ooh. But then the tree came down, and I have full sun. Just blazing sun on this and it's just it's so much better so if you if you really want to grow great plants choose full sun for your pond now i have a pretty good water volume there's you know over 250 gallons there so the water never gets very hot if you have smaller tubs you've got to think about temperature wise and ted coletti's book talks a lot about that um, but if you want to maximize plant production, like full sun, it just doesn't get any better. I mean, you can see there the red flowers, those are cannas. They bloom so well. The water lily blooms. Um, just so much more productive. So next slide. So what kind of maintenance do you have to do? Are you going to get to that? I can talk about maintenance. So I do really no maintenance. Um, I have to harvest a lot of water lettuce and water hyacinth. I just throw them on my compost. Um, I do that several times a week. Those grow really fast. I don't do any trimming. I don't do any water changing. I do have to top off because, you know, it gets hot in the summer here and there can be evaporation. Um, and a certain, we'll talk about this more later, but the pond becomes a victim of its own success at a certain point and that bog box becomes so overgrown it can be choked out and jake and i are actually working on ways to try to make it so that doesn't clog so bad 
but I don't really do any maintenance on anything. Um, I don't water change. It's uh, topped off with rain water. I, I don't even use dechlorinator when I top it off because my water is very low chlorine, no chloramine. I cannot tell you that that is a good idea for your water, but it is fine for my water. Yeah, because it's going to gas off a lot quicker, and especially yeah. with all the water movement you've got going on in here, too. Yeah, and I feed the fish very little. They mm -hmm. they have to live on what, what lands in the pond. I mean, I do feed them once a week or so, but those fish are very happy. There's a lot of insects landing in the pond for them to eat. So, next slide. All right, so this is the filter box. So you can see that black hose is there that brings the water from the, the bottom of the main pond up to the bog box. And that is attached to a homemade spray bar made out of PVC pipe. And you can see at a certain point, the pond is a victim of its own success. And I've never seen a pond like this, like overgrown and looking this good. Like it's it's insane how i mean so this year so there we've done three elephant ears in the back of it in the past this year we're going to just do two elephant ears um so those are elephant ears those are alocasias and those are like six feet tall um and there's different species of or cultivars of alocasia and those just go really tall um What's but the yeah, uh, creeping thing the right here? Jenny is the light green, and creeping Jenny is Lysimachia. It's mm. just the stuff you buy in a garden center that comes back every winter for me. So that overwinters. The darker green stuff, I took that from my aquarium. That is uh, Bacopa Caroliniana, and that gets pretty little blue yeah. flowers. I uh, thought it looked familiar, but like the immersed growth starts kind of creeping around too. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, it's so something about overflows uh, that that falls into um, a waterfall. There's a spillway that drains over it. So it there's a slab, a piece of like limestone slab that it runs over. And I don't really get I mean, it, it's never so full that like, yeah, I think in the last falling. picture. Yeah, the, you yeah. Have right here. That's the waterfall. It never gets so full that like there's so much rain that it overflows. Mm -hmm. Like I don't keep it that full. So, but yeah, the pond does get to be a victim of its own success at a certain point, but it looks really good. So, all right, next slide. So this was my pond last year. So those big plants at the back, those are elephant ears. And I mean, you can just see how overgrown it is. You can barely even see the bog box. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's just a riot. So um, I like it. I really like the way that looks though. That's I know. I, I mean, I got to tell you, it makes me so happy. I mean, I, I like it. I think I love it more than my indoor aquariums. Also because it's just, you know, I only get it a few months of the year. So I'm all, I try different plants in it every year. I just, you know, I try different things from the, the garden center. You'd be surprised the things you can grow in a bog filter box. Next year, I think I'm going to try growing ginger root from roots from the grocery store. I mean, you can be really experimental with it. So next slide. So I did some extra tubs last year. So the tub on the left is... um. That's a galvanized, I think that's like 10 gallon tub. I just bought it off Amazon. There's no fish in there because it's pretty small and it gets kind of hot. Yeah. Um, I wanted, so those larger leaves there, that's a lotus. Unfortunately, it was kind of shaded by the main pond and I never got it to bloom, but it was kind of a fun thing. There was some water hyacinth in there that did bloom. Maybe we can get that lotus to bloom this year, though, because those do overwinter. And then on the right, I put in a tub pond. So that's a preformed pond that you're supposed to dig those and put those underwater. But I kept it above water. Um, I just wasn't very happy with that. I'm going to give that to my friend Jenny this year. Was that like a 20-gallon? or? No, that thing is like... 
um, I think it's like 70 gallons or something. Oh, geez. I, it's like really hard to get a frame of reference with these pictures. I know. So that's this. I think that's the same frame as Rico's pond size. Okay. You just buy those at Lowe's or mm. Home Depot. But we're going to give that to my friend Jenny and Jake's going to dig her a pond and we're going to put that in for her. And then I'm going to get a big stock tank pond. And so I can have another pond that way. So the plants in it did grow well, though, but it just, it needs the earth to support the shape. So I wasn't very happy with it, but, you know, it was a fun thing to try. So anyways, next slide. Whose Mustang is that? That's Jake's. Nice. Yeah. All right. Okay. So I know this is hard to read for you, so I'll, I'll read them off. So I have tried a lot of pond plants over the years. Some things I... I've gotten as ideas from that book. Sometimes I'll just, um, you know, I'll just Google lists of marsh plants and try those, or I'll Google things that'll grow in wetlands and I'll try them. Or sometimes I will just try things from my garden center and see if they'll pond. Cause you never know. Sometimes they will. And I've tried a lot of different plants to see if they'll grow on my pond. And more often than not, they will grow in that bog box. So you'd be surprised the things that will pond. Um, so if you have full shade, you can do hostas. You can just dig up ones from your yard. Um, I've tried begonias, um, just, you know, the cheap kind for, for bedding. But I imagine even like the tuberous begonias that are really pretty might do well. Um, caladiums are really beautiful. And those have to have shade or they just sunburn really bad. I grow those actually out of my aquarium and they're awesome. Um, I have done alocasias, so those elephant ears, they... You know, they do okay. They're never going to get as big as they do in my main pond. They're just, they're not. So water hyacinth, they'll grow. They will they won't bloom, but, you know, they're a cool floating plant. Water lettuce, it grows pretty good. Mint, it's really great to grow mint in your pond box because you don't want to grow mint in your yard because it's really invasive. But if you want to grow mint... It's kind of a nice place to keep it contained. And I usually do grow mint in my pond because I like to have some mint. Um, polka dot plant is Hippoestes. That grows like a weed and that likes shade. Um, prayer plant, I grow that in my aquarium. That does really well. Lucky bamboo, that does well. Um, pothos, everybody knows pothos. You mm -hmm. can, it won't overwinter in the north, but you know, it'll grow all summer for you. Um, Creeping Jenny, and that overwinters in the north. Like, that comes back every year. Um, and Eguizetum is horsetail, and there's some really pretty varieties of that that are even variegated. Or you could just dig some out of the dish. I mean. So if you have full sun, though, you can grow pretty much anything on that left list except for caladiums. They're going to caladiums uh, annuals like you have to get new bulbs every year. I, you can over. So a lot of these things that have bulbs, if you weren't lazy like me, you could dig them up and keep them in your basement like canna lilies and calla lilies and caladiums. You could dig them up and keep them in your basement and overwinter them. But I just like to buy new ones every year. Well, it's not, I mean, they're not that expensive to get. No, my, bulbs. my dad is really good about digging up his cannas every year. And he usually gives me cannas to grow. And they're they're pretty good. And he, he grows elephant ears, too. And he'll dig them up and give them to me. But I also like to try new things every year because it's fun. Mm -hmm. So I, I do end up buying new ones every year. If you're in Florida, though, a lot of those are perennial. So if you have full sun, you can just, you can grow so many things. You can grow either alocasias or colocasias. So those are elephant ears. Um, you can grow a lot of your stem plants from your tank. You can grow them immersed and some of them are really pretty. So they're a fun thing to try. Um, a lot of different kinds of a hibiscus will work. Um, they, I mean, I had pretty good success with a couple kinds of them um water hyacinths will bloom and they have pretty purple flowers they only last like a day though canna lilies are so beautiful though not every variety does as well um 
So you can get pond specific ones, but I usually just roll the dice and get whatever the nursery has and see if they work. Calla lilies work, um, corkscrew rushes. So, and those are perennial in the north. Those will come back. Um, you can get alternantheras in your garden center. There's a purple variety of them and they're different than the aquarium alternanthera. So those are really pretty. I have but, a purple variety of alternanthera or so says the label. <laughs> it might be the same one, but I got to tell you, they grow way better above the, the line. Oh. Yeah, I love alternanthera, but man, it is a fussy, frustrating plant. Yeah, sure. immerse, it's not fussy. So last year I did Mexican petunias. Those got really big, but they had pretty little pink flowers. Um, so one thing I found that did not pond is Nicotiana, which is like a flowering tobacco. Didn't pond, didn't work. Um, another thing that didn't really work was blue lobelia which I was really surprised about because red lobelia does so well. That's lobelia cardinalis. That's, that's a, that's a marsh plant. So, so when I'm, you say it doesn't do well, it, did it die off? Did it just it kind of died. stay how it was? Oh. It just died. I mean, it tried to grow for a while, but really just didn't do well. Um, pickerel rush. I'll have pictures of that later. That's a classic pond plant and it's native to the United States too. Um, so that's a fun one. Um, and then my two favorites are water lilies and lotus. And I will actually talk about how to grow those at the end because those are, those are awesome plants. Just awesome. So, and there's, there's even more plants and I've forgotten about some of them. Like I've forgotten about some of the ones I've grown. Um, there's, that book lists so many more, but I would just urge, oh, I've also grown uh, turmeric. I grew that one year. I mean, you can kind of just get, just try it. Like, just try and see if it'll pond. Yeah. Because you'd be surprised. It'd be cool to have like a list of herbs that you could grow together in a pond, like the mint. Yeah. Um, a lot of herbs are from the Mediterranean and they like kind of drier soil. Mm. And that's why, like, I don't think, like, thyme or rosemary would do well. Basil, it might. It might grow well in the bog box. I don't know. Maybe I'll – I just don't have that much space. Right. So, oh, the other the other one that does really well is um, blood dock. That's a classic pond plant. And I have some of that. And that, that comes back every year. So, next slide. So this is the left. Those are some cannas. Those are so beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and they come in red and yellow and orange and variegated. And then that purple plant on the right, that's the pickerel rush. And I think there's pink and white varieties of that now too. Um, Alishon is mentoring trickers. I'm ordering from trickers this year. I want to see if I like them. I've heard good things. Um, but uh so pictured there, there's, yeah, that's the purple pickle rush that blooms all season it's, and it's perennial. So it, it might come back for you, but there's some water lettuce there. That pink flower that's blooming is a water lily. So there's a lot of stuff going on there. So next slide. Yeah. So these are some water lilies I'm growing. I have two different varieties of them. One of them I sent to Rico. So the one on the right, I can't remember the variety, but that one does get kind of big. I wish I had a smaller water lily. I divide those every year. Um, and to keep them growing, I do have to divide them. The one on the left is a smaller water lily. I just got that one, but it's bloomed for me pretty good. So water lilies are hardy, whether you live in Northern Minnesota, clear down to Southern Florida. So they're hardy lots of places. Um, Is I this think, one bulb? Um, yeah, that's one. It's a tuber. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a tuber. And I I keep it, well, how I overwinter it is I just sink it to the bottom of the pond in the pot. So when I grow them in two and a half gallon plastic tubs that have no holes, I use Ted Cluddy's directions. Um, I use cheap like clay heavy soil. Um, and I, I, I grow them exactly like he recommends and I fertilize them like crazy and I use pond tabs. 
so which is just fertilizer meant for ponds and they bloom all season long as long as i keep on top of fertilization and at some point in the fall like that one on the right that pink variety i do have to divide so yeah but they're they're fun to grow and uh i mean i wish i had more room i wish i could grow more of them so next slide so this is a lotus so you can see so lotus is kind of an interesting plant you get that bare root it's a tuber um, and they're kind of expensive, but they do overwinter and they are, you know, they're perennial and where I live. So um, you plant them and you don't fertilize them at first. They have to be planted in a really big round container. And um, they first set out these floating coin leaves. You can see on the left how some of those leaves are floating. And then they start sending up aerial leaves and they'll bloom and they get huge. So I don't know if you can see on the right. That's my pond by the end of the season. God. Yeah. <laughs> so that's in that's in early October. And it's so overgrown. There's annuals planted around there. That's not all pond blooming. But you can see how big that lotus is. I'm going to put it in an even bigger pot this year. I'm going to take out the cannas and just let that lotus get really big because those those flowers are like that big. That's that variety is Princess Ellen of Ten Mile Creek, and it's so pretty. And I just want more of it. So that's Lotus. Um, and again, Ted Coletti's book talks about how to grow those. Next slide. I think that's it. So I guess we'll take questions now. I guess I'll also take your questions too, Stephen. So, um, well, let's see what the see what the chat's got yeah so alishan says home depot small paint buckets work great i agree that's what i use to plant my water lilies for um lotus you want something bigger if i could find oil pans that's what i would use because they're a big round shallow tub but i just ordered some and alishan says yes there are micro lotus at lodi but I just wasn't able to buy a micro variety because I ordered too late in the season. And that brings up a good point. Now is the time to, to order your pond plants. Um, from so online. where do you get yours from? Well, I'm, I've yet to find a place I recommend. I'm going to try Tricker this year because I've heard good things. But I do not recommend Pond Mega Store. I think they have really bad service. Megastore usually uh, is not a good name for a I mean, they're, they're a pretty big pond purveyor. Mm -hmm. Maybe other people have had a good experience, but I have not. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to try Tricker. They have a very good reputation. They're in Ohio. I might, I might just go there with Jake and buy stuff in person. So, because we don't, my garden centers don't stock a lot of pond plants, but a lot of times things are just sold as annuals that will pond well it's pretty much just lotuses and water lilies that i need to get special but i've okay. given away a lot of water lilies too because i have to divide them and i get several plants every year so i'm i'm gonna have to divide up my lotus it's gonna be very very big so I'll be dividing that up and my water lilies I'll be dividing up. And then where do you store them? You just, you said you like just bury it or keep them. They just, they live year round in the pond. The water lily, I sink to the bottom. Okay. The lotus is just, you don't want to sink a lotus down because it has hollow, hollow stems. Um, and if those hollow stems are cut and get submerged in water, the, the water will, make its way down to the tubers and it'll rot. Uh, okay. So I've cut them back, but the stems are still above the water line. So hopefully they'll come back. I mean, my other one did last year. So, you know, we'll see. Um, you know, it wasn't a very harsh winter here, but it was still winter. So. So Joe Stan wants to know about frog span and frogs. Yeah, um, so my ponds are, um, they're elevated, so I've never had any frogs in them. I mean, I, I wish I did. That would be really awesome because 
I do have goldfish in my pond, but I would really love to have frogs. That would be cool. But frogs will eat your fry if that's a thing you care about. But, you know, my pond is probably like, it's like hip height. So I don't get any frogs in it. All right. I'm just pasting in. Okay. Yes. Got it too. Oh, yeah. Thank you for pasting. Perfect, yeah. that. It's a really good book. <laughs> It's by Ted Coletti. And that's, I'm assuming he uh, linked to the third edition as well. And yeah, you said it's available on uh, in Kindle format, right? Yeah, you can, I got mine on a Kindle and it's not expensive. So it's, I think about $20. I mean, it's a really nice. good book. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. Waiting on more questions to come in. So, um... So what is the difference between the lotus that you plant in here versus like the aquarium lotus, like the dwarf tiger lotus? Yeah, so this is not a lotus. That's a nymphaea. It's a water lily. So you just call it a lotus. Yeah, it's lotus. it's incorrectly okay. named. It should be it should be a it should be a nymphaea, which is a water lily. So it's just named wrong. You could you could actually grow one of your nymphaeas outside. Your, your red tiger lotus outside if you wanted. I've seen people do it. Um, I don't believe they're hardy if it's very cold, though. They won't overwinter. And there a lot of people really do like to grow the tropical water lilies because they smell amazing and they have, like, blue and purple colors. They bloom more. Mm -hmm. And they just treat them like annuals. And if I had more pond, I would try it. But I don't have much pond, so... Mm -hmm. So critters getting in the planted pond. Um, the biggest thing I have a problem with are those nasty Japanese beetles. And they um, they munch on canna flowers. Um, my pond friend, Michael, he suggested, I can't remember. There was something we were going to try, but it was sold out and I couldn't get it. It was a natural remedy. I mean, I don't want to put any can't use pesticides of course because of my fish so um and as for critters you know the only critters who visit my pond are like all the neighborhood stray cats but they never get any of the fish they just drink out of it and i really like to watch them from my window so i guess i don't mind so um i've never snakes i mean again my ponds are high enough it hasn't been a problem I don't, raccoons just, I don't know. There's raccoons in the neighborhood, but they don't seem to bother it. I know other people have had problems, um, but I haven't. Mosquitoes, I have the fish do eat mosquito larvae. In the smaller tubs, I use mosquito dunks, which are um, Bacillus thuringiensis, so they're bacteria that interferes with the life cycle of the, lar the mosquito larvae, so they don't... F they don't uh they don't go from the larval stage to the adult stage so it's a natural remedy that works and i i use those because i don't want to breed any more mosquitoes but even though i do that god we have so many mosquitoes here it's like well oh, yeah well look who you're talking to in Louisiana. i know i mean it's it's bad so, uh, yeah, yeah. And Edie talks about dragonfly larvae, and I know a lot of people do have problems with dragonfly larvae. I think the goldfish, if the go it can fit in their mouth, the goldfish will eat it. Um, and my goldfish are big enough. If you have tiny fish, like those will eat the fish. So, you know, um, I've never, I've never really noticed it. Again, like these ponds for me, like they're kind of more about the plants. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, I, mean, I missed this one from the, past, the yeah. cicada invasion. Yeah, it really wasn't an issue. I mean, we did have the cicadas here, you know, the 17 year ones. Um, they would come and drink out of the pond, but they didn't really bother it. So, yeah. Man, this this right here is is a good enough reason yeah. right here to uh, get a pond. Just to yep. they do, um, they do, they do eat mosquito larvae. They do, they eat anything that falls in the pond. So, um, 
Yeah, I, if your pond is big enough, you always want to put some fish in it. I still use the mosquito dunks anyways because I don't want any more mosquitoes. I'm very sensitive to mosquito bites. So, yeah, and moving water helps too, but always have some fish in your pond. Mm -hmm. You guys are, we're all fish keepers. Of course you'll have fish. Well, yeah. Why? Why else have a pond? I mean, plants I obviously, but I mean, yeah. In that little lotus tub, though, that's not big enough for fish. It's just no, it's too small. So, yeah. Uh, and then Brandon says, "My live bear pond gets filled up with tree frogs every year. Backyard sounds like a tropical rainforest at night. Sometimes it's so loud it will wake you up. See, that would annoy the piss out of me." Aren't those tree frogs the really invasive ones to the Cuban tree frogs? I, I don't know, but <laughs> yeah, they you have know, a very constant sound, and you can just have one outside your window, and that's enough for me. You know, I wish we had. We don't have many frogs up here. It seems like, which is kind of sad. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, and Ted Coletti's book, by the way, talks a lot about pest control. So, um, you know, some people put nets over their pond to keep, like, birds of prey away from them. But again, like, I just kind of let it happen. I mean, if, if a bird gets a fish or two, well, I mean, they do spawn some. So, no. Right. Oh, yeah. What is your uh, substrate in the big pond? It's just cheap pea gravel. Like, this stuff that's a couple bucks a bag. Oh, in the um, in the main part of it too. Yeah, okay. um, in the main part of the pond, I don't use any substrate um, because all those plants are potted. Oh, okay. You don't want to. I mean, I don't recommend just letting your plants like grow wild on the bottom because you want to be able to take them out and move them around and cut things back for overwintering. That's so true. I use containers. Um, I really like cheap gravel. Um, for growing my water lilies and lotus, I use, um, if you have like dirt in your backyard that's clay heavy, you can use that. Um, I usually just mix either some clay and cheap, cheap soil or sand and cheap soil. And then I cover it with a layer of either cheap sand or cheap gravel because you don't want a lot of dirt getting in the water column. Yeah. So I weigh it down with that, but, um, you know, it's, uh, it's all cheap stuff. Just how I could afford to do it. You know, so Eduardo's really got a two tier pond, 800 and 500 gallon. That sounds like a dream. Um, yeah. That sounds really great, Eduardo. I mean, especially since you have a longer growing season than I do. I have a very tiny yard. My yard is only about 15 foot by 15 foot. And, so, uh, he has largest issues protecting the fish from getting eaten by the snakes and birds and raccoons. Yeah, we have birds here. Yeah. I've never seen a raccoon. I we have possums. A well, lot we of have possums. tons of raccoons here, but I mean, I think that stray cats are probably the biggest issue. And oh yeah, that too. For they sure. don't seem to get any of the fish. So and like I don't know, those stray cats are like Jake's friends, so he would he would not be happy about them disappearing <laughs> <laughs> yeah but yeah you can use netting i use netting on my pond to overwinter it to keep leaves from from uh blowing into it so every spring i have to do a big clean out on my ponds where i scoop out all the leaves i usually give it a water change i take all the water lilies from the bottom and I bring them close to the service surface so they can start putting out their leaves. Um, you know, and then in May, Jake and I will take and we'll, we'll scoop out all the gravel from that filter box and we'll clean it and, uh, we'll, you know, get everything replanted. So, but right now that water's cold and I don't want to touch it. <laughs> In the fall, I cut everything back. I cut the water lily leaves back, cut the lotus back. I sink the water lily to the bottom of the pond. If I was going to keep my elephant ears or my cannas, I would dig them up and I'd put them in the basement. I'm too lazy for that. And I like to try new things every year. So, so what if you don't have a basement? Um, Do you have a shed? 
He kind of. I mean, I have a, a vinyl shed. It's not certainly yeah. certainly not insulated in any way. You have a garage. Carport. Hmm. I'm not sure what you would do. I mean, you're just saying it's got to be in a uh, dry, insulated place, basically. You want it? Do you want it to be like not so warm? You want it to be a little cool compared to your house. Okay. And but you don't want it to freeze. Right. So why I would? My dad, when he overwinters his canna lilies, I think he packs them in peat moss. You could also wrap them in newspapers and put them in a burlap sack. I mean, people do different things. So. But I never overwinter mine because I just want to do different stuff every year. Yeah, that'd probably be what I would end up doing because if I'm just starting out, I'm going to want to, just like with my aquariums, I want to try all the plants at some point. Yeah. So, Dee Dee, um, I do my plants in different ways. Um, so a lot of my marginal plants, I get, they sell mesh pond baskets at Lowe's and Home Depot and they're really cheap. They're like $2 each. Um, I've also used laundry baskets and I'll line them with gardening fabric. Um, for my lotus and my water lilies, you want plastic pots that have no drainage, no holes in them. And so I'll use like um, two and a half gallon paint buckets for my water lilies. And I'll just use the biggest round container I can find for Lotus. This year I actually ordered some plastic pot. I'm going to order some plastic pots from Tricker that are because you want a round pot for Lotus so the roots can run around the interior of the pot. Um, but for my other things, I use, I use baskets and I fill them with gravel. And um, before I plant things in my bog, I, I, you know, if they're like a terrestrial plant, you know, from the garden center, I take it out of its cell, I shake all the dirt off, maybe I give it a little spray to get some some of the dirt off of it, and then I just plant it as is in the bog. I don't do anything else to it. Um, I used to fertilize the elephant ears in the bog, but they are out of control. I don't want them to be any bigger. Like, they're getting enough. The cannas I do fertilize to keep them blooming. Um <coughs> And I just use pond tabs. I so buy what, are, what are pond tabs? Are they just like Osmocote in a in a capsule or something? Um, they're not in a cap. They're kind of like a hard. I don't have any of them by me. They kind of remind me of sea chem root tabs. They're much cheaper though. Mm. And just if you search on Amazon for pond tabs, or if you're ordering from a pond place, anyways, get pond tabs. Yeah. I've also grown plants, by the way, in clay pots. Like I grow a um, papyrus a lot of years. By the way, there's a couple different varieties of papyrus, which is cyparis. Um, there's king tut, prince tut, and baby tut. Baby tut's the smallest, which is good for my pond. And I, I will just plop those in a decorative like stoneware pot and grow it as is. I just cover it with pea gravel on the top. Mm -hmm. So that works, you know. Um, yeah. So, yeah, half whiskey barrel pond. So, yeah, those are really fun. So, um, first of all, if you're going to keep fish in it, I would line it. They actually sell plastic liners for those because, you know, you don't want any like creosote leaching out to harm your fish. Um, but so I did one of those years ago when I was in grad school and I grew like cypress in it, that um, uh, papyrus. That was really pretty. You can get miniature water lilies or lotus. Those are pretty. You could also just go to the garden center and see what you can get. Um, if you're going to do water hyacinth or water lily, by the way, in general, if you're going to do water hyacinth or water lily, just buy one because it will grow so Apparently, yeah. <laughs> Like, you don't spend the money on more than one. Even if you have a giant, huge pond, like, just, just buy one. It's enough. So you could do that. Um, it's really just hard, like, to hold back and not do more stuff. But also Ted Coletti's book has so many good ideas in it. And just, you know, take a look at that book and then go to your garden center and see what you can get. You can also try plants from your aquarium. 
Yeah, I mean, I've got obviously back up with Caroliniana. If I want more of that, yeah. it's just like take a nap and wake up and you've got more of it. I know, and I don't have any of it anymore. So I might get some from you in the spring. I don't know. That bog box is so choked out. Maybe I, I need to restrain myself. Well, yeah, just let me know. And you know, would overwinter. You know what I have mostly. Yeah, so. and that would overwinter in your time, your zone. It won't in mine. It dies back. So, <coughs> but you know. Next question. What we got? Um, Eduardo appreciates the pictures. Well, thank you, Eduardo. I'm really jealous of your pond, and especially since you have a lot much longer growing season than I do. Yeah, so if I he's... get like late May through mid October. That's all I get, and then and it's it's the view I have from my office. So right now, it's really sad. So don't get the dry little root thing calling it water lily from Home Depot. It took two yeah. years to get a real plant from it. Yeah, huh. I would agree with that. They sound like they're a good bargain, but they are not. They're um, Get something from your garden center or order it from a pond place. They're expensive. I'm going to tell you, a water lily is like 40 bucks. If you have a pond friend who's dividing your, their water lilies, that's a good deal. I've given away so many water lilies. Um, but yeah, those, and the other thing is a lot of times if you're looking like on Amazon at water lilies and stuff, they're the tropical kind, which pretty much you have to grow as annuals. They yeah. are very beautiful and they're very fun. And I, if I had more room, I would grow them, but I don't have a lot of room. So everyone needs to find themselves a pond friend. <laughs> everyone does. I have a pond friend. He's in Indianapolis. I mean, and then. We helped him expand his pond. He's huge, Koi. So, but yeah, everyone needs a pond friend. It needs to be like pondfriend.com matchmaking. I know. I know. Everyone needs a pond friend. Let's see, $39.95 last year for one lily. What? Yeah, it's expensive. And those lotus, I think I paid $60 for mine, which. I will be able to divide it this year and I'm like, I'm going to give one to my pond friend because he's created like a part of his pond that he's like separating with snow fence. So the koi can't get there because he's determined to grow a Lotus. Mm -hmm. So that's nice that I'll be able to give him that. Okay. Question from Renee. Yeah. So repotting and fertilizing your water leaves, you probably need to repot your water lily every single spring when you take it out. So um, what I do is I um, pull the whole pot up, confirm that it's still growing, which it did. I mean, if you look way back on my Instagram, I have a picture of it up from last year. The water lily came back, but I will take and then I'll dump it out and then I'll pull the, wash the dirt away from the tuber and it has this big long tuber and you can see different growing eyes out of it. And you can just take a sharp knife and cut between all of those. And then I, I just pop them up again. And um, I pop my water lilies using directions in Ted Coletti's book, like it works. And I use two and a half gallon cheap plastic pots. Um, I put a handful of Osmocote at the bottom and then I add a layer of um, like cheap pot topsoil mixed with either clay or sand. And I add like four or five root tabs into that. And then I add in the tuber and then I cover that with soil. And then I cover that with either a layer of sand or gravel just to keep the soil in place. And I sink it back in the pond. So, and I've given away a lot of those, those water lilies, including to Rico. I mean, he has one of mine and I think it bloomed. So yeah, what about the Lotus though? Have you sent him or can you even ship it? Um, I could ship Lotus. So I, someone in the chat mentioned that Lotus have very delicate stems mm -hmm. or their growth points on the tubers are very delicate. And that is true. You just need to wrap them very carefully. I will be dividing up my Lotus when it gets warmer. Um, that's something I'll probably do before Jake and I do our big pond clean out. So I'll divide that up. And uh, 
you can ship them. I mean, I bought mine as a little bare root tuber and um, just a tuber like piece of it, like that big. And it had maybe four or five growing points. And I, I potted it in this big pot and it grew. So they do ship. Kenny says, uh, I wish I lived in a warmer place. I would do an African cichlid pond. He's asking me if it stays warm where I'm at year round. I mean, our winters average in the 40s, in, except for the days it's not. Like, it's kind of uncharacteristic of this area, but like last Saturday night, it got below freezing um, for half the night. <laughs> and, you know, we, we so we have those days. And, you know, every now and then, like once every couple of years, we have that super extreme hard freeze type of yeah. thing where it gets into the teens. Um, so like it, there's just those panic nights where, you know, the city shuts down and the roads are icy and, you know, everything yeah. freezes over, but it, it, for the most part um, it's mild. Yeah. I mean, I have a lot of friends down in South Florida who do rainbow fish breeding in their tubs and yep. the fish look so much better. Uh, they're phenotypically different if they're raised outside than inside. From the sunlight, yeah. the colors yeah, the are just sunlight, much more. Diet, who knows what it is, but they, and it's a lasting difference. There's a few people in our Rainbow Fish, the um, Rainbow Fish Live, the Facebook group who've done summer tubs and they've shown the difference between their, and this, these are the same parents of them, indoor bred versus outdoor bred. And it's, it's striking. Very Speaking exciting. of colors, I just noticed this afternoon. I had not seen it before. My my Cali Tawa. I mean, they're they're tiny still. Mine but tiny they, too. I got them a full year. <laughs> they turned a weird color. <laughs> just two huh. of them. They and they were kind of like doing a little back and forth sparring, but it was like a very strange, like completely different from what they normally look like. The tail had lost a lot of color. And like they were more blue. I don't know. Yeah. Like it's weird. I know it's mind change color a lot too. So, you know, Steven, you could, Radnocentris is a really great one for outdoor tubs. They'll just tub spawn for you. And uh, the guy who got my rads from Marcel Wurthrick, he's in Madison, Wisconsin, and he, he raises his fish in tubs. I mean, I might put some rads outside this year. Am I in one of my tubs? I haven't decided. I mean, I just, I'm really focused on the plants. Like the fish are so like indoors. I'm kind of equally focused on my rainbows and my plants, but outdoors, like it's all about the plants. It's all, it's, it's like, it's all about the plants. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I get that. I would definitely want to go overboard with the plants and see what I can get to grow, but yeah. you know, got to have the fish. I would, I would definitely prefer to have a fish that I could leave out there year round, just out of laziness, because I know. You know no I, would, I think the rice fish, if I had to do it all over again, like if I had a really bad frost spell and my goldfish all died, I think I'd put rice fish out there. I think that would be really cool. And they, they can take, as long as they don't freeze solid, they can live. Yeah. Glossolepis or Chalatharina in outdoor pond, not where I live. They're pretty um, tropical. Yeah. Uh, and they're, you know, you could you could get them started, Stephen, and bring them in because you have a pretty long growth season. So you get them started and then you'd raise them up inside. I would try it if I were you. I've thought about even like for my Cali Tawa, just like spawning them on a mop and then taking them off outside. Just seeing what happens, you know, and Ted Coletti's book actually talks a lot about that, like how to set up breeding tubs and like what fish to use and how to take your fish room outdoors. I mean, he, he brings his whole fish room outdoors. So you could bring guppies outside if you want to do some, get your mosh pit, cool. you know, the mosh pit annex, but those, they can't stay outside. It gets too cold, I think. Yeah. Unless, unless you want to, I mean, Unless you want to do the heater thing, but that's... Uh, I mean, I have to do the heater feed thing for the goldfish. Hmm. You know, and I use a stock tank heater. There's a reason my electric bills are high. Yeah, I was going to say, what does that do to your electric bill when you have to uh, my, run that? My, 
My house is cold and drafty. It would be high without it. Oh, it's, yeah. My house is very cold and drafty. I live in an old house. So, yeah. <sighs> yeah. Um, let's see. We got another. Oh, yeah. And rainwater. Fantastic trigger for outdoor breeding. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So, let's see. We're at the. End of the hour. I'm checking to see if um, if Austin is actually going to go live. I'm just refreshing. But so Dee Dee just wanted to know if the fertilizers make it out of sorts for the fish. Yeah. So I use pond tabs, which are fish safe. Um, they're marketed for ponds, and I stick them like underneath the water lily sand, like down into the pot. But even if any of it makes its way out. Like those elephant ears that are in that bog box will suck it right up. So, I mean, I've never bothered to test the water in those. Well, I mean, it's also pretty like lightly stocked, um, but it, it should be fine. Yeah, I, I, I feel you. And freaking you know insane. Mine, mine was not that high, but it also was not as low as I would like it. I live in a very drafty old house. Ours, ours can be in the 300 range sometimes in the summer. Yeah. All right. I'm not seeing any other questions and I see Austin just went live. Um, so if you, come up with a, if you come up with a question or we accidentally skipped one or, or whatever, uh, feel free to you know, leave a comment on the replay and uh, we come back and check and we'll, we'll, Kelly will answer if it's a pond question. I don't know, <laughs> but uh yeah, I appreciate everybody showing up and uh, asking questions. Hope y'all got some good information out of this. I sure as hell did. So I hope yeah. everyone does a pond this year. It's fun. All right. All right. So thank you to the mods and the chats and the lurkers and replay crew. Appreciate y'all. And uh, see y'all next week. I'm not sure what our topic's going to be, but, you know, it'll be about plants. <laughs>